Welcome to this uh, award ceremony for the European Prize in Combinatorics. As you may know, this prize is awarded at every Eurocom edition, starting from the 2003 edition in Prague, and it's awarded to researchers under 35 who have contributed excellently to the field. So this event will take place in two locations. I'm here in the center of Barcelona in this beautiful building which is the headquarters of the Catalan Math Society and the Institute of Catalan Studies. And there are a few people here in the room and some academic authorities at the main table. And we'll, have, we'll start here with a few institutional speeches and then we will pass the word to Professor Nesetril, who is in Prague, and will present the award and the laudatio and the talk. And then to conclude, we will return to this main room. So I guess we can proceed, so it's my pleasure to present uh, Professor Dulos Arbera, who is the president of the Catalan Math Society. Well, thank you, Anna, and I would like to thank you, the organizers of this Eurocom conference, to, well, to ask to the society to contribute to, to this organization and to, to give, uh, no, to, to help you with, the, with this nice room where we can have this award ceremony. As Anna was explaining, this is the, this building that we hope you can see in person, no, in very soon, hopefully, no, next time. Sometime you can really come to Barcelona. This building is the headquarters of an institution, which is the Institute of Studies Catalans, the uh, Institute of Catalan Studies, no, as you translate in English. This is an institution that was founded at the, founded at the beginning of the 20th century. So actually it, is, uh, it has a double format. It has the format of an academy, so there are these permanent members that pass a tough selection process, no, and that are permanent members of, of this institution. And then they also have uh, societies, scientific societies of all branches of knowledge. No, One of them is this Catalan Mathematical Society, that, uh, okay, the history of this go back to the 30s years or in the 20th century, uh, but uh, really the, the, the real work started in around the 70s, no? Uh, well, because as uh, you may, well, 
Um, you may know that here there is, no, the, the story uh, has a long parenthesis between the 30s and the 60s, 70s, so that's another issue. So the, the Catalan society, the Catalan Mathematical Society works to, uh, to help mathematics and to popularize mathematics at all levels. So we go, we do very different tasks, so from uh, getting very much concerned because the lack of mathematic professors in secondary school to to host research activities no like uh, like this one so it is for us it is a pleasure no to to foster our international our, our internationalization no in helping with this eurocom conference i understand that this is 10 years of eurocom so it's every two years so this is the 10th time that the conference started actually in no i understand in barcelona in 2001 no and then a little bit later, they started these, these prizes, these prestigious prizes. And okay, so thank you for, for being here. Thank you for counting with us. And I don't want to, to talk more since I think we are all willing to know. No, as I, nobody knows who are the, the winners, no? In principle, they are still secret. So, so I will stop my speech here, no? And, Okay, let's continue. So, yes. thank you. Thank you, Dolores. So, so next we will have, uh, let me introduce uh, Professor Jordi Llorca, which is the Vice Rector of Research of UPC, the Technical University of Catalonia, which is the host of this uh, online edition of Eurocom. So, Jordi, please. Thank you for inviting me here today. It's a, great, it's a great pleasure to be here with you in this ceremony of the European Prize of Combinatorics. As you know, this edition of the Eurocomp is organized by the Universidad Politécnica de Catalunya, UPC. And I want to say that at UPC, we are very proud of our mathematicians. <laughs> uh, we have more than 200 uh, professors and researchers uh, who do research in mathematics and its applications. Uh, during its nearly 20 years of existence of the School of Mathematics and the Statistics at UPC, uh, we have a good reputation of excellence, quality, and academic standards. The students here, uh, I mean, these are the, st the, the studies on mathematics chosen by the students that they have a high, very high school academic records, and the only ones in Spain with a demand, which is much higher than the, than the number of places which are offered. So, uh, we, again, we're proud of our mathematicians, and uh, it's, uh, it's nice to see how they organize this, this event today. Um, also, less than one year ago, uh, we created the uh, Institute of Mathematics at UPC, and uh, we also uh, hope that uh, the results will be very uh, successful in the next years. Um, to summarize, uh, as a Vice Director of Research of, at UPC, um, I'm, I wish you great successes in this Eurocom. Um, when we are scientists, we like to meet in conferences. If it's possible to be face-to-face, uh, -face, if not online conferences like this one, because of the circumstances. And usually you find other people that, uh, that you establish collaborations. And these collaborations are very important. So uh, I really wish you a great uh, Eurocomp and also this European Prize for Combinatorics to be a way to strengthen these collaborations and the community. So thank you very much. And uh, next, uh, let me introduce you, Professor Luis Alceda, which is director of uh, CRM, which is the center, uh, sorry, center of Catalan of mathematical research, and who actually hosted the first uh, Eurocom edition 20 years ago. So, okay, thank you very much, Jana, for for introducing me. Um, uh, for me, it's a great pleasure to be here. Also. Uh, it, it was a great pleasure to listen that Anna considers me as an authority, although I am not uh, much used to this. Um, CRM, uh, by vocation and by mission, which is an official research institute created by the Catalan government, it has as one of its legs the, the, the community or collaborative dimension. I think that CRM is proving this um, all the time, constantly. 
Uh, I could now explain you better what does it mean this and put maybe a presentation with official statement, but I prefer to say that CRM philosophy uh, in this community that I mentioned is informally, it could be informally said as helping without disturbing and collaborating without imposing. And this is what we are trying to do with this collaborating with the Eurocom Congress. Uh, to show this, I have brought a picture from the first Eurocom that it's uh, already here. And to say that, that CRM is uh, planning uh, to increase and to improve this uh, collaborative dimension. And in fact, I am having discussions with my general manager in CRM to increase budget for, for, for those activities. And so I can promise that, that, uh, that collaboration with Eurocom and other activities in the future can be strengthened and reinforced, and I hope that it will be more useful. I don't have anything more to say, just to, to thank organizers for giving CRM the opportunity of collaborating with such uh, an incredible and nice uh, initiative, and welcome to all of you to the, to the, to the activities, and let's hope that we have a uh, that we are very happy when we listen the, the names of the of the prize winners. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Luis. So I guess we can move now to the more scientific part of the afternoon, and we'll connect uh, or we'll pass the word to Professor Neshetril, who is in Prague, who will take on the award winners. Welcome to the most festive moment of every Eurocon. Welcome to the award ceremony. I would like to say that the award ceremony is always uh, uh, in a very nice place. And I personally know this main hall of the Estudis Catalan in Barcelona, which, uh, uh, which is very nice. And uh, it would be beautiful to, to be there in, per in person. And I mom, warmly recommend you when you will come to Barcelona to try to uh, visit, visit the place. So the, the European Prize in Combinatorics is traditionally awarded biannually at the Eurocom meetings. It, uh, it is, uh, the prize uh, consists from a diploma and a monetary award of two and a half thousand euro. And the prize is awarded to a European researcher not exceeding age of 35 for international, achieve, uh, international achievements in the field of combinatorics and related fields. And the uh, right and duty of the awardee is to give a, a plenary prize-winning lecture at, uh, at Eurocom. Mm. I will, uh, uh, I will, uh, to change the slides, I have to, I have to move it, right? Yes, yes, yes. So here is a little history of the, of the prize, and it's a very illustrious history, and I want to spend a little time on it. The former winners of the prize uh, are the following. It all started in 2003 in Prague, uh, where the prize was given to Daniel Akin, uh, Derek Oshus, and Ellen Plan. And it continued in Berlin in 2005, where the prize was given by Dmitry Feitner Kozlov. And it continued in uh, Seville, where in 2007, when the prize went to Jill Shefford. It continued in, uh, in 2009 in Bordeaux, when the prize was given to Peter Kibash and Balash Segedi. Then in 2011, it was in Bar uh, Budapest, and the prize went to David Conlon and Daniel Kral. <clears throat> in 2013, it was in Pisa, where the prize went to Wojciech Samoty and uh, Tom Sanders. And then in 2015, in Bergen, the prize went to the prize, uh, prices, I should say. I mean, the, it, was, uh, it was not shared, but the prices went to Karim Adi Prasito, Zdenek Dvořák, 
and Rob Morris. And then in Vienna in 2017, uh, the prices went to Christian Reyer and Marina Vyazovska. And then in last time in 2019 in, in Bratislava, the price went to Richard, Richard Montgomery and Alexei Pokrovsky. I would like to say, as we all know, I mean, the all are laureates are right now not only professor, but, uh, uh, but they proved to be prolific and important researchers and obtained important grants and some even more, uh, more important awards. Perhaps the European Prize in Combinatorics helped them at the very start of their careers uh, to launch their career. But let us, let us go to present. As it is customary, the jury is revealed at the prize ceremony. The members of the jury for this uh, 2021 edition are Professor Bella Bolobash from University of Cambridge and University of Memphis, Professor Jano Spach from Alfred Reine Institute of Hungarian Academy of Science in Budapest, and myself, Jaroslav Neshetřil from Charles University in, in, in Prague. I cannot forget about the, about the sponsors. Mm -hmm. uh, we have three traditional sponsors. This is the, the Center for Risk in Mathematics, Theoretical Computer Science Application in Prague, uh, called DIMATIA, which is uh, sheltering all the prices so far. And we have uh, traditional organizers of the of the of the corresponding uh, Eurocom, so this time organizers in the uh, Universitat Politecnica de Catalunya. And we traditionally for many years we have a, we have a sponsor from, from the publisher Elsevier. And this year we have a new, new, new uh, 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 new institution sponsoring the, this is the Cambridge University Press, and we are very happy to to have the Cambridge University Press uh, Press with us. Welcome to the board. It is uh, involvement of prestigious publishing houses is important uh, for us, and I shouldn't I shouldn't forget that we are thankful to the uh, to the Societa Catalana de Matematica. <laughs> and uh, uh, the institution this uh, study catalans for providing us this uh, possibility to broadcast it from from their very nice room and i also i also want to thank my secretary petra mirsteinova who is sitting next to me as you see it here and who is uh, who assisted me with all, all the formalities of the prize and uh, without her my life would be much, much more difficult. <laughs> yeah. So, so and now we can we can announce the winners of the of the prize. The jury. Uh, uh, here is a comment from the from the report of the jury. The jury received a number of high-level individual nominations. The quality of research in combinatorics and related areas is truly amazing. By unanimous decision, the jury decided to award four 2021 prizes. In the alphabetical order, these are the winners. The first prize goes to Peter Palpach from Budapest University of Technology and Economics. The statement, which is on the diploma, reads as follows. For his numerous profound contributions to discrete mathematics, especially combinatorial algebra, partial ordered set, that's and combinatorial number theory. His theorem on progression-free sets in Z4 to the N proved to be proved with the Krot and Lef is a milestone in discrete mathematics. Peter, you will receive the diploma, which is which exists. I mean, it's uh, here on the 
on the screen. I don't know whether you see anything. And I'm not showing the money, which you get, which you will get by the bank bank transfer. <laughs> Congratulations. I don't know whether uh, there is a possibility to applaud, but I will, on the behalf of everybody, I want to applaud you. The second prize, for the winner of the 2000, goes to Julian Sar Saraz Sar Sar Saharas Buda. Saharas Buda, and uh, from University of Cambridge. Here is the statement of the, of, of the jury. For his deep and important results proved by applying combinatorial methods to problems, problems in harmonic analysis, combinatorial number theory, Ramsey theory, and probability theory. In particular, he proved striking theorems on ancient problems of Littlewood and the geometry of polynomials and on 50 year old problems of Erdes, Shinsen, and Selfridge. Julian, here is the diploma. If it exists, it will be mailed. We sent it by, by courier, by DHL, to the address which you gave us, and we transferred the money to your the account which you, which you stated to us. The third prize, so, oh, oh, I want to applaud you, I forgot that. The third prize goes to Lisa Sauerman <clears throat> from Massachusetts, now from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And the statement of the, of the uh, jury is the following. For her profound contribution to combinatorics, particularly for results on the growth rate of algebraically defined classes for the solution of an old Erdes, Fodri, Rousseau and Shell problem and for the solution of edge statistics conjecture. Now the uh, play, Lisa Sauerman was invited as a plenary speaker for Eurocom and her lecture is not scheduled today, but it will be, she will give a plenary lecture, which will be as well the prize winning lecture on Thursday at 16.30. But I will speak still about the program. Here is the, Lisa, here is the diploma, which you see it a little bit, just to prove that it exists. And, uh, and we shall send the money to the, to the, to the, to the uh, uh, call to the bank which you, which you, which you gave us. Congratulations. The last winner, last but not least, I mean, in this alphabetical order, I repeat, is uh, Istvan Tomon from, from Eigonosische Technische Hochschule in Zurich, ATH uh, in Zurich. And the statement of the jury uh, is as follows. For his fundamental contributions to extremal combinatorics and the theory of partial ordered sets, in particular for his proof of Erdes Heinal conjecture for string graphs and the solution of a problem of Brown, Erdes, and Schoch on extremal numbers of surfaces. I mean, here is, here is your diploma, this one. I mean, did you see anything? And, uh, and you will, and as I said, the money will be sent to you at the place uh, which you, I want to congratulate you again. <laughs> I will let me show the winners of the 2021 edition, uh, edition again. <laughs> I think we, we can, I think this year, was extremely strong in the nominations, and we are very happy that we could give uh, these four prizes. And that, of course, is uh, as well thanks to you that we get uh, more sponsors. So here is the schedule of the of, of the rest of the, of the afternoon or of the uh, uh, of the prize-winning lectures. So the, the there will be three talks, approximately half an hour each. And each prize winner will be introduced by uh, will be introduced by particular person listed here. So Peter Palpach will be introduced by Dan Kral, 
Julian Sahas Rabudan uh, will be introduced by Professor Bela Bolobash. Sorry for the typo. Bela, I mean, of course, Bela deserves to two professors, and he is, in fact, double professor, but it's a typo on the, on the screen. And uh, there is Istvan Tomon, there is a long A as well, uh, there, which will be introduced by Professor Janos, Janos Park. And as I said already, on Thursday, September 9, the Lisa Sauerman will give the preliminary talk, which will be as well uh, as well prize winning lecture, and it will be she will be introduced by Professor Jakob Fox. Um, so we are looking forward to the lectures of 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 the laureates, and uh, and I think uh, the from my part the prize winning uh, ceremony is closed. Maybe just on behalf of everybody, I'm applauding everybody on the bar. Here I am raising the glass, you know, for, for, the, for, the, um, for, for all the winners. And I'm toasting it with my secretary. Good health to you. Thank you very much for your attention. So, so maybe uh, so we maybe are a bit ahead of schedule, but since there is nothing else going on at the same time, maybe we can just proceed with the talks. That's fine for everyone. Uh, let me even introduce uh, Peter Palapach and his talk. It's indeed a great pleasure for me to have this opportunity to introduce him and to introduce his talk. Clearly, the highlight of his research is the work on the structure of, uh, of uh, subsets of Z4 to the N, avoiding the free time arithmetic progression, which was mentioned in the citation of the prize and which uh, paved uh, a path uh, to the resolution of the cap set problem, which was resisting. Uh, existing methods in uh, additive combinatorics for more than 30 years. The so-called crude left path lemma, which was indeed a true game changer. And uh, I would like to quote here the, from the blog of, uh, of Tim Gowers on, on this lemma. It's easy to understand the proof, but the argument has a magic quality that leaves one wondering how on earth anybody thought of it. And uh, indeed, in my view, this magic of simplicity and elegance goes throughout the whole work of Petty in additive combinatorics. Among his many other results, I would like to mention his work on the number of multiplicative Sidon subsets, a problem which uh, can be traced back to the work of Cameron and Erdash, or an alternative proof on the, on the, on the, number, on the infinite number of monochromatic solutions of, uh, of an equation x plus y equal to z squared in two colorings of integers, which simplified the proof of Green and Linquist, and at the same time, it also improved the bounds coming from this proof. So I think we all are now looking forward to, to Petty's talk, which will concern the configurations, uh, oh, sorry, which will concern the subset of zp to the n, avoiding particle arithmetic and geometric configuration. Okay, uh, so thank you very much for the, the introduction. Uh, it's a great honor uh, to be a recipient of, uh, of this prize and, uh, and to give this talk. Uh, also, congratulations to, to Julian, uh, Lisa, and, and, and Istvan. Uh, so I will talk about uh, some problems when there is some forbidden configuration uh, in FP to the N, and we are interested in the extremal size of, uh, of such a set. Uh, just to give some examples that uh, won't be all addressed uh, during my talk, uh, such a configuration can be an arithmetic progression of given lengths, uh, corners that are these uh, three point configurations uh, are also an interesting case. Um, we can relax this condition uh, to talk about right angles. By right angle, uh, I will consider a triple of three vectors x, y, and z where x minus y and uh, x minus z are perpendicular to each other. Of course, uh, there is not always a clear distinction between arithmetic and geometric uh, configurations. For instance, this last example uh, is, a, is a parallelogram, but at the same time, this configuration is, an, is in a one-to-one -one correspondence with uh, four-term arithmetic progressions in, in Z4 to the n, but also in, in Fp to the n, uh, a p-term arithmetic progression is, is nothing else but an F, a fine line. So these problems, in some of the cases, it's, uh, it's already difficult to decide whether the answer is exponentially smaller than the corresponding group or not. 
of course, at uh, other instances, for instance, in case of uh, right angles that are easier to find, uh, the extreme size can be much, much smaller, uh, only, only polynomial in, in the dimension. So I will start with some algebraic uh, questions and then move to more geometric ones. Uh, I will use the notion RK ZM to the N for the largest possible size of the group ZM to the N which avoids k-term arithmetic progressions. If uh, the length of the progression is three, and, uh, and then is either three or four, uh, then uh, here are summarized uh, the, the current known best bounds. Uh, so it is, it is known that uh, these sets must be exponentially small, but in both cases, uh, there is a gap uh, between the, the lower and upper bounds. One sort of way to achieve lower bounds is um, with the help of the product construction, because uh, if there is a set which avoids uh, three term arithmetic progressions, then uh, by the product construction, we can bubble it up uh, and, and get a bound in uh, high dimensions. For instance, this lower bound comes from a construction uh, from dimension uh, 480. And, and for the upper bounds, uh, this, this variant uh, of, of the polynomial method that uh, Dan has already mentioned, uh, is needed. Uh, there is some difference between the odd and the even case, but if uh, instead of three, we take another odd prime, then uh, the same argument works. And uh, this easily implies that uh, even if we take a composite M, uh, this quantity is, is exponentially small. If uh, the length of the progression is at least four, uh, then uh, it is not yet decided uh, as far as I know in any of the cases. Uh, whether the answer is exp uh, exponentially small or not, except uh, one tiny example when, uh, when m is uh, divisible by six. Uh, I will say a few words about this, uh, this later. Um, but before doing so, uh, I uh, explain a bit the, the lower band construction for R, R4, R3, Z4 to the n, because uh, this construction this construction is achieved uh, with not by a product construction. Uh, so here is the lower bound that uh, we gave with the S words. Uh, so this is the max of the sum, which involves these binomial coefficients and uh, dimensions, dimensions of uh, linear codes with certain minimum distances. Uh, and uh, in fact, if you are interested only in the asymptotic, uh, then it suffices to take an optimal t to two thirds times n is fine. And uh, even the first term uh, would give uh, the same asymptotics. Uh, the first terms dominate uh, the total sum. But uh, uh, it still makes some sense to, to include uh, those smaller terms, uh, besides the fact that they contribute uh, to the whole sum just by constant factor. Uh, because this bound turns out to be tight uh, if the dimension is not larger than five. It might also be tight if the dimension is larger than uh, five, just uh, it's quite difficult to determine the, the exact values um, uh, for R3 of, uh, of any group like this. Um, and because of, of this, that the answer is tight uh, up to dimension five, and uh, also by another heuristic uh, that, uh, that can be seen through a subset reformation of the problem. Uh, the, we conjecture that uh, three might be the, the right constant uh, in case of uh, R3, Z4 to the N. Uh, in this subset reformation where I don't go into details, uh, if, uh, if this involves subsets uh, are all subspaces, uh, then three to the n is also an upper bound, and in the small dimensional cases, uh, the the best constructions uh, are achieved. Uh, the choices where all these subsets are either empty or subspaces. Uh, we also have lower bounds for arbitrary uh, composite m, but uh, when m is uh, is different from four, four uh, we do not believe uh, this uh, this bound uh, to to be tight. Uh, now I will uh, move to the case of composite M. Uh, I illustrate by an example uh, why is it an easy consequence that uh, 
for instance, uh, R3Z15 to the N is, is also exponentially small. Inside this group, uh, we have a subgroup isomorphic to Z3 to the N, and we can apply uh, the cap set bound in, in each of the five to the N cosets of this group. Uh, this way, we, we, we obtain this, uh, this bound, which is exponentially smaller uh, than 15 to the N, since R3Z3 to the N is exponentially smaller than uh, 3 to the N. Uh, we can also swap the rows uh, and uh, get this other one and, and, and take the, the better one. Uh, so these are the, the easy consequences. But uh, if, if M is a prime power, then, then something better can be done. So for instance, for Z9 to the N, the easy bound uh, is obtained after observing that Z3 to the N is a subgroup, uh, and uh, it results in exponentially small bound. But uh, as it was observed by uh, three groups of, uh, of researchers, if uh, we apply directly the method into this setting, uh, then a better bound can be obtained. Um, so for instance, for nine, this is the, the resulting constant. Uh, this was uh, proved uh, independently around uh, the same time by Blasiak, Church, Kohn, uh, Groschow, Nasson, Sabin, Umans, and by Petrov and, and by Schreier. And once again, the there are some differences between the odd end and the even case. Uh, so in case of two powers, uh, some additional technical difficulties uh, arise, but uh, Petrov and Pohata could uh, do such an improvement uh, also in the case of Z8 to the N. And as far as I understand, uh, this would go on for, uh, for high, higher powers of, uh, of two as well. Uh, so I have mentioned the, the odd case. And in the even case, uh, M the modulus was always divisible by four. And uh, I didn't consider M which has a residue to two mod four. Uh, and the reason for this is that uh, this case uh, can be easily seen to be equivalent with the, with the odd case. Uh, so if M has residue two mod four, uh, then we just get back uh, the case of, uh, of odd values of M. However, there is still something interesting uh, about uh, Z6 to the N. Um, because um, in this case, the answer, whether the limit of the nth root of the extremal size is, uh, is six or, or smaller than six, uh, can be the answer, uh, which is not a uh, uh, 100% correct uh, statement. Uh, because interestingly uh, and somewhat surprisingly, it's not clear uh, whether this, this limit exists. Uh, the reason behind this is that. Uh, if uh, we study this quantity, then the product construction doesn't work. Uh, from the product construction, uh, it would easily follow that uh, the answer would converge to, to some constant. And uh, the only question would be, what is this constant? Um, in this setting, uh, product construction fails, uh, fails to work. Uh, and I, I can't prove that this limit exists. So instead of limit, uh, I should better talk about the, the limb soup of the sequence. Uh, and it can be seen that this limb soup is, uh, is smaller than six. Uh, here uh, I summarize uh, the results of uh, Collins and myself. So in dimension two, the extreme size is, is still 25, uh, but uh, it's not a priori clear that uh, the answer should be at least 25 uh, because we can't use the, the product construction. And uh, in, uh, in dimension three, uh, we already get uh, an extremal value which is smaller than the third power of five. Uh, it lies within this interval, but uh, it's certainly smaller than uh, 125. And uh, in, in Z6 to the N, uh, for six term arithmetic progressions, exponentially small bounds can be obtained uh, because here we can reformulate the problem of finding uh, a six term arithmetic progression. Uh, to finding uh, the same three-term arithmetic progression in, uh, in two subsets of uh, Z3 to the N in a large family. And uh, then one can use the uh, supersaturation extension of, uh, of this gap-set bound, uh, which roughly states that uh, if you have a large set, then we will have a lot of arithmetic progressions of length three inside it. And if you have too many in too many of these subsets, then uh, there will be uh, a 3AP, uh, which is contained uh, in at least uh, uh, two such subsets, uh, subsets uh, which yields these bounds. If we 
plug-in decoherence in on caps at bound in this uh, second formula, we get uh, something worse than uh, than this constant. But uh, if uh, the bound gets improved uh, in a certain way, then uh, the second formula might be better than than the first one. And uh, for for lower bound, we have only the the trivial construction. Uh, nothing better than than the trivial construction. So a, a quick summary. Uh, so here I sum summarize the cases when the quantity is, is known to be exponentially small, and uh, as far as I know, it is uh, not uh, known to be not exponentially small in many of the cases. Uh, it would be pretty interesting to add anything to here or or there. And uh, now I will uh, switch to something uh, more geometric flavor. Uh, we will stay in the group uh, FQ to the N, uh, but uh, from now on, um, Q will always be an odd prime. In certain cases, it could be even. In certain cases, it could be uh, an odd prime power, but uh, to be safe, uh, I will stick to, to odd primes. And uh, a triple of vectors uh, is called a right angle if uh, this dot product uh, happens to be zero. And uh, R and Q will denote the largest possible size uh, of a right angle free subset of FQ to the N. Uh, recently, when it uh, proved uh, the bound uh, Q uh, to the power of N plus 2 over 3, and uh, one year later, uh, again, Shang uh, gave uh, another type of bound. Uh, so one, one can look at this question in uh, at least two different ways. Uh, we can Think of it uh, as uh, the dimension is fixed, and uh, we take uh, larger and larger values for, for Q, or uh, which is the setting that uh, we will consider here and that we also consider in case of arithmetic progressions. Uh, the field is fixed, uh, so Q is fixed, and uh, the dimension uh, tends to infinity. So in, in this setting, when it's bound uh, is exponential, and uh, Gesham Gwen's bound uh, is, uh, is polynomial in the dimension. And in fact, they uh, conjectured that uh, the, this is the right order of, uh, of magnitude. Uh, uh, even more recently, uh, Naslund uh, improved on the upper bound. Uh, this is still the polynomial of degree Q minus one. Uh, the, the first difference is in the coefficient of uh, N uh, to the Q minus three. Uh, and, uh, and they, and they just mentioned uh, that n is a trivial lower bound uh, because uh, if we take an, uh, an orthonormal basis, uh, then uh, they form a right angle free set. With Borsic, Matocs, and Schreffner, uh, they improved on, on the bounds of uh, Geschenkwen and Nashlund by, by a factor of n. Uh, so now the upper bound is n to the q minus two. And uh, as a lower bound, uh, we constructed a set of size uh, uh, n to the roughly q over 3. Uh, I want to explain the construction, just uh, uh, try to give a heuristics uh, why this uh, q over 3 is here in the exponent. Uh, so a possible sort of way to, to get a construction is uh, to take uh, the middle third of the residues, which, uh, which form a stunt-free subset. Then if we can construct a subset of FQ to the N, uh, such that each element of this set is self-orthogonal, and whenever we take two different elements, uh, the dot product uh, lies uh, in this set, uh, then, uh, then the set A is, uh, is free of right angles because of, uh, of this quick calculation. And uh, such a set can be constructed of, uh, of size uh, N to the Q over three. Um, uh, and uh, we conjecture that this, this might be the, the right, uh, uh, right exponent uh, in this question. Uh, Maslund uh, also considered uh, the generalization of, uh, of right angles called uh, key right uh, corners, uh, where all these dot products uh, need to be zero. Uh, here we, we also presented the lower bound construction, but uh, here the gap is, uh, is getting larger and larger. Uh, then uh, when the, the value of k 
okay is uh, is getting larger uh, maybe here i uh, we we skip a, a few slides uh, to to have time uh, for one uh, quick proof uh, so we studied uh, different uh, kinds of uh, of configurations involving the uh, right angles in uh, most of the cases we use the the slice rank method which is the uh, formation of uh, of the the polynomial method that we used uh, for three AP threads uh, uh, and this reformation was uh, was given by by Tao. Uh, but uh, let me jump uh, to uh, to the statement that I I would like to prove. Uh, so starting uh, from this uh, right angle free set. Uh, we we can arrive uh, at the following problem. Uh, let's assume uh, that uh, we have a, a binary code of length n, uh, where no Hamming distance uh, is uh, is divisible by a given prime q, and it's an odd result of that sort. Uh, then in this case, is the the size of the q code is at most the sum of the binomial coefficients from and choose q minus one uh, to, to and choose zero, and later uh, different proofs uh, were given by by Franco and uh, by Babalis, Babalis Nevili and and Wilson, and uh, we gave yet another proof uh, of this statement uh, and also uh, proved the lower bound, which uh, looks very similar. Just uh, here we add up only every second term from the the previous sum, but uh, still they are both. Uh, polynomials of degree uh, q minus one with the, the same main coefficient. And uh, it it turns out that uh, both bounds uh, are sharp in infinitely many cases. Uh, the lower bound turns out to be tight uh, when n is divisible by q, and the upper bound uh, turns out to be uh, sharp when uh, n has residue minus one mod q. And uh, to conclude my talk, I, I will prove uh, the statement about the, the upper bound. Uh, here we, we do not use the, the slice strength method, but uh, polynomials uh, still arise. Uh, it's, a, it's a short self-contained proof uh, uh, that, uh, that I uh, explain now. Uh, so let's, let's think of this uh, binary code as a subset of uh, the set plus minus one to the Q. Uh, thought as a subset of uh, of fq to the n, where q is an odd prime. Then, if we consider the dot, dot product of x minus y with itself, then uh, since x i minus y i is, is either two or zero or minus two, uh, this dot product uh, nothing gets but uh, four times uh, the Hamming distance of x and y. Let's assume that the elements of uh, power set are a1, a2, a r then to each element of this set, we assign a polynomial. Uh, to, uh, to AI, we assign uh, this polynomial and uh, we restrict it to A. Uh, this will be useful soon. And the observation is that uh, if we plug in AJ into a different FI, then uh, the result is zero because uh, the dot product uh, should be non-zero because uh, the Hamming distance is uh, a different from zero. Uh, so when we raise this non zero number to the Q minus first power, we get one. Uh, so the final result is, uh, is zero. Uh, and if you plug A i uh, to, to F i, so the polynomial assigned to itself, then, then we, get, we get a zero. Uh, so F i a j is chronic at F i j, which um, readily implies that uh, F1, F2, FR are linearly independent polynomials. And uh, if you know this and we want to give uh, an upper bound on R, uh, the size of the set A, we just need to show that uh, they all live uh, in a small, small dimensional subspace. Uh, so let's do so. Uh, a quick calculation and uh, the observation that uh, whenever X is an element of the set A, then all the entries of X uh, are plus minus ones, and also all the entries of these uh, AI vectors are, are plus minus ones, we get that uh, this dot product uh, can be written as uh, a linear polynomial. Uh, 
uh, of, uh, of the axis. Uh, this is the point um, where we use that uh, the, the PI polynomials uh, should be restricted to, to A. Uh, so we get that, that FIX uh, is a polynomial of uh, X1, Xn of, of degree at most Q minus one. Uh, this is not yet enough, uh, but uh, we can also observe that uh, since in A, uh, all the vectors has entries just ones and minus ones, we can reduce the, the exponents uh, according to their uh, residue mode two. Uh, so this way, uh, each Fi can be reduced uh, to a multilinear polynomial. The degrees is still at most uh, Q minus one, uh, which uh, yields uh, the assets found. And if Q happens to be divisible by N, then instead of uh, 2N minus this uh, homogeneous linear polynomial, uh, we have just this uh, homogeneous linear uh, polynomial there, uh, 2N uh, vanishes. And this way, even after reducing the exponents uh, mod 2, uh, we get only uh, monomials with, uh, with even uh, total degree. Uh, and this gives the, the improvement of, uh, of the assets found. Uh, thank you. So I was told I should not be sharing, just introducing, but it seems that nobody else is now in charge. So thank you very much for your talk, Patty. And uh, if there are any questions, then I think everybody can pose them in the chat and I will be very happy to read them. So it does not seem to be the case. So in that case, uh, let me thank you on behalf of all the whole audience for your very nice talk. Thank you. Thanks for the talk and uh, congratulations right. on the prize. And so we will move to the next talk, which uh, will be introduced by Professor Bella Bolos. So <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, our second prize winner Julian Sahas Rabode hails from uh, Vancouver. After his BE at Simon Fraser University and an MA at, uh, at Cambridge, he became my research student. He took to research like duck to water, showing exceptional breadth and ingenuity, and obtained deep results in several fields, often in uh, collaboration. He applied methods of combinatorics probability theory and analysis to hard problems in extremal graph theory, fundamental Ramsey theory, arithmetic Ramsey theory, and classical harmonic analysis. For example, in arithmetic Ramsey theory, Julian was the first to prove results about monochromatic solutions of systems of equations containing exponentiation, not only low degree polynomials. In harmonic analysis, he proved the first major result about Littlewood's cosine problem, showing that a sum of n cosines has at least one quarter log, 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 log n zeros. Paul Erdős would have been delighted to uh, solve this problem because he worked on it for quite a bit, would have been very glad to see this result with a logarithm iterated four times. And Julian just went from strength to strength. His three last sets of results, I shall mention, are pro probably his greatest achievements. First, a considerable portion of Julian's mathematics concerns central limit theorems and the geometry of polynomials. The basic question is the connection between the roots of uh, a probability generating function of the probability generating function of a random variable and the distribution of this random variable. Starting with Paul Erdős and Paul Turan and continuing with Borsell, Brandin, Lebovitz, Liget, Pimentel, Ruel, and others, many outstanding prob probabilists and analysts work on these problems, but Julian surpassed them all by a long way. Second, he proved the famous and notorious Littlewood conjecture, which was made 60 years ago and whose origins go back to the beginning of the 20th century. 
several outstanding analysts, Kahan, Kerner, Montgomery, Bombieri, Burgen, and others had worked hard to prove the conjecture without success. A little bit polynomial, there is no, uh, not much reason why you should know. Uh, in, in this company, it's not, not very well known. So a little bit polynomial is one whose coefficients are plus minus one. And the result, which was conjectured by Littlewood, is that there are flat Littlewood polynomials, polynomials whose moduli do not vary that much if the complex variable has modulus one. Third, in, a, in several papers, Julian proved major results about covering systems, the favorite topic of poor Erdős. These results include a version of the Erdős Selfridge conjecture and Schinzel's conjecture. I am glad to say that Julian's mathematical career goes extremely well. After his PhD, he was awarded a postdoctoral fellowship of excellence under the guidance of Robert Morris at IMPA, the great institute in Rio de Janeiro, and the fellowship at uh, a fellowship of Peterhouse, the oldest college in Cambridge. A few months ago, he was appointed a university lecturer in Cambridge. Ladies and gentlemen, let me congratulate Ju Julian Sahasrabude again and invite him to give his prize lecture. Julian, many congratulations. Thank you very much. Everyone can hear me, I assume. Yeah, very well. Wish I wish I could see see everyone everyone out there. Um, but uh, yeah, so thank you very much. I'm I'm very happy to uh, accept this prize, and it's. Uh, it, I must say it's a very exciting time to be in combinatorics. It really feels like the field is is coming into its own uh, and sort of connecting to all sorts of things. So I, I thought I would speak about something, uh, if you forgive my slightly whimsical title, Two Problems I've Loved. But uh, I thought I would talk about a, a couple of different topics um, to give some sort of feel about the kinds of things I'm interested in, the kinds of connections that I'm interested in. Um, but I, I hope to really convince you that the, these problems, um, although sort of, it, yeah, as, as Bela mentioned, one will be in harmonic analysis, they're, they're really the heart of it is all, all combinatorics, and that's really where the, the reasoning comes from. One only sees, sort of needs a sprinkling of technicality from these other subjects to get it, get these things to go. Okay, so... Uh, so, so let's start out with the uh, the, the first of, of of two two parts. So, and and the uh, the object here is going to be a random matrix. This is A sub n. It'll be an n by n matrix drawn uniformly from all plus one minus one symmetric matrices. Okay. So, what does it look like? Here's my um, artfully crafted photo of a random symmetric matrix. Okay, so the ith row is the same as the ith column, like that. And uh, okay, everything is, uh, everything above and including the diagonal is independent. And the, the question I'd like to ask about this matrix, uh, uh, for, well, in today's talk, the question we're going to consider is, what's the probability uh, this matrix is singular? Right? So perhaps the most basic question we could ask about a, a matrix. Perhaps, perhaps. Um, so what? So what comes here? And uh, to to sort of get going with this question, let's let's. I'll actually immediately sort of simplify the question a bit. So here we have all this confusing dependency, right? The the upper half of the matrix and the, the lower half and all this. So let's consider a slightly simpler question right away, and then then we'll come back. So <clears throat> so let B N be the matrix with all iid entries and all plus minus one 50 50 coin flip right? so it looks like this everything iid here and of course it's very meaningful exactly the same question what's the probability it's singular and it turns out um, as many of you will know that this is already leads to some pretty deep uh, and interesting mathematics so this this story as far as far as i know goes back to komnosh in the in the 60s 
uh, who already yeah is doing some really interesting stuff with it. Um, I, and of course, I don't have time for the full story, but I'm going to sort of jump ahead. Oh, sorry, I forgot to say what the what what, what we expect here. So, 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 what do we expect this? The answer to this question might be, well, <clears throat> if if one thinks a little bit, how how do we sort of arrange for this thing to be singular? Well, one way is for have to have two rows here to be the same or equivalently essentially the same but with a minus sign in front of one of them okay and then the same could happen for two columns and you know with the hope hopefulness that the the world is simple and beautiful one might conjecture that indeed uh this 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 this, this dominates the singularity probability so this equality here is the hopeful conjecture and and indeed is a folklore conjecture uh, so this singular probably is the same as two rows or two columns equal up to sign, and then you can sort of work out just what this probability is. So for us, it's basically just two to the minus n plus some lower order noise would be the conjecture. But and and uh, so so this problem actually turns out to be very well understood. Um, and let me just mention two uh, two results in this in this direction. So I, I really recommend these papers if you are looking for something uh, to to read here. So this uh, after these early results of Kamloch, there was this really big breakthrough of Kam Kamloch and Samaretti in the '90s, who managed to obtain this uh, exponential upper bound on the singularity probability. So in some sense answering the question uh, up to confusing questions about exactly what that constant is. And then in a, a really interesting sequence of papers that followed, um, we ultimately learned from this lovely result of Tokomarov that, that this conjectured answer, this two rows, two columns equal up to sign, uh, is essentially the truth. Right, so we have this very satisfying answer. Okay, so it's not totally worked out we, this, there's some some quibbles you might have with this little low one but for us this is a very for today this is a very satisfying answer to this to this wonderful question and uh, okay but this this was a bit of a diversion our real question for today is what is the probability the symmetric matrix and um, now now we're a bit we're a bit uh, more confident about making some sort of guess about what comes after this equality right so here we have the same situation, two rows could be equal. Now this two columns being the equal up to sign is the same event. And so it seems pretty reasonable to conjecture uh, as a sort of a folklore conjecture that this is indeed the case. So um, what's sort of uh, fascinating, fascinating to me at, at any rate is that this is uh, getting this, even, even knowing these, these very lovely results for the IID case seems to be a really significantly harder problem. Uh, so somehow the the these dependencies in the symmetric matrix uh, uh, make our life much more difficult. And I again, no time really for the history, but let me just sort of quickly flash some flash some results up here. Um, so and 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 let us note that okay, so the okay, so it's obviously not too easy, but Let's also note that there's this interesting kind of convergence, if you if you grant me this, um, to this value of exponential e to the minus root n log n, right? There's this sort of convergence, especially these last results. And uh, this is actually not uh, entirely a coincidence. And this value, this e to the minus root n log n, um, is represents a natural barrier in the problem. And this was actually a very interesting observation of this lovely paper, in this lovely paper, I should say, of Campos, Matos, Morrison, Morrison, who sort of showed that to get beyond this barrier, we need to do something sort of, uh, well, I'll show, I'll show you now. So here's my uh, beautiful rendering of a uh, symmetric matrix. Okay, so, <laughs> all right, so this is the same as this. But the uh, sort of happy observation when you want to prove things about this is to use the bottom half because we say, aha, this part of the matrix is all independent. So then that sort of allows us to use ideas and techniques from the IID case um, if we sort of just apply it to this lower uh, triangle. Okay, so there's still definitely complications in doing that, but 
Um, this is actually what all of these previous results do. And the really observation, interesting observation of uh, Campos, Matos, Morris, and Morrison is that if we only use this bottom half, and this is just coming along for the ride, we, we're, some, we're stuck at this e to the minus root n log n. Okay, but from the other side, of course, this is a very interesting question now. So how do we use both all of the matrix? How do we get into these interesting dependencies um, that are arising with this uh, matrix? And that's, and that's what's really interesting to me about this, uh, this problem. Okay, so uh, the results I'd like to talk to you about is with uh, joint work with these three uh, charming guys. So uh, who are these? So this uh, on, on the left here is Marcelo Campos, who's a, a wonderful, brilliant graduate student of, uh, of Rob Morris. Uh, this guy in the center is probably many of you know, Matthew Jensen, who's a, a, a recent hire, or maybe one year ago, uh, started in, in Birmingham. And actually, uh, an old friend of mine from from part three uh, in, in Cambridge. And this last guy here in front of his record collection is Marcus Michelin, who's who's a recently been a frequent collaborator of mine. Okay, and my last name is long, so I figure I'll, I might as well write it down again. So uh, the the first result I'd like to share with you today is. Uh, is uh, is the following improvement on this uh, uh, the on the singularity probability? Okay, so here we have our a n as above, uniformly drawn from all plus one minus one matrices. Then the singularity probability of this is exponentially small um, up to this. So this sort of resolves the singularity question as long as you don't ask me any tricky questions about this constant c. So this it's certainly not log two that we get here. So, uh, okay, so, uh, um, so this, um, and so this is sort of natural because, well, it's, it's the sharp up to the constant thing, but also we've seen, or I've hinted at, that there's this, uh, that there's this barrier that needs to be overcome. So let me just say a few words about how we sort of tackle this, uh, uh, this barrier and how, how we get around it. Of course, there's not much time to say, to, to really get into it, but I'll sort of try to drop in in at, 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 at a couple key moments, and and perhaps you'll sort of get a hint of where the where the uh, magic is happening. Okay, so uh, let me start by saying something incredibly stupid. So uh, if I have a matrix A, so this is my random matrix, um, A is singular if and only if there exists some V on the unit sphere for which a v is equal to zero. Okay, just by definition. But now what I wanna rewrite this thing slightly in a slightly strange way, it's sort of a smoothed version of it. So I'm gonna introduce, it's actually a slightly weaker statement as well. So I'm gonna introduce this epsilon here and I'm only gonna care about epsilon up to some exponentially small scale, okay. And now the, our matrix, if our matrix is singular, there'll exist a V for which this AV, this L2 norm is at most epsilon root N. Okay, so sort of a smooth event to work with. Um, and with this up here, it seems pretty natural that we're led to understand probabilities that look like this, right? So what's given, given some fixed direction, what's the probability that A times V is sort of much, much smaller than it, the, this norm is much, much smaller than it should be. And here, here we kind of get, uh, we get into some of what's really interesting about this problem. And, and the reason is, is because this, this probability here actually has a huge amount of variation as V varies over the sphere. So just to, just to hint, at, hint at really the, the, the range that we can get here, is say v is like uh, the constant vector. I've just renormalized it here to, uh, to keep it on the sphere. Um, then this probability that you're less, less than epsilon n is actually like one over root uh, n all to the power n. Okay, and this is actually extremely large. Um, and for comparison, 
let's just look at uh, the, what, what if I just take name now V at the opposite end of the street extreme, it's just like a random point on the sphere. So uh, then what do we expect this thing to behave like? Well, we expect it to behave, uh, the probability that AV is less than epsilon root N to be like epsilon to the N. And here epsilon is as small as exponential, right? So this is much, much, much smaller than, than this bound. And really we get everything in between. So this is sort of just a hint at what sort of, one of the interesting aspects um, of this problem is this, this, this probability has this, uh, all these different behaviors. And, and one of the sort of challenges is uh, sort of dealing with all these different vectors in the right way. Okay, so I don't, um, yeah, so I want to sort of like now jump ahead and just write down, uh, sort of throw a combinatorial statement at you that sort of comes out of this sort of thinking. So this is sort of jumping down the road a little bit, but I, th I think we can sort of appreciate it as a, as a nice combinatorial statement and is really the key challenge, the kind of combinatorial challenge, say, behind solving this problem. Okay, so, so this is the key sort of uh, uh, thing that we need to prove. And let me just sort of parse it a little bit for you. So for a given scale epsilon, right, so, between, so strictly less than one and at least exponentially, uh, so all the way to the e to the minus n, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose a random point on the sphere, right? So here's my sphere. I choose a random point on it. And I want to look at the, uh, the probability, so this outer probability, that this inner quantity here is much, much larger, so exponentially larger than what we would expect for a random point. So if we remember the previous slide, we should expect like just a constant epsilon to the end here. And now I'm choosing L to be much larger that, than this constant. So I want to show for all scales, the measure on the sphere of these points, which have large, this quantity large, is sort of super exponentially small. Okay, so I'm not going to really get into the exact, why we need the, this exact number here. Um, uh, but basically what we need is this sort of much, much faster than exponential. So I can choose this L large and even this two is is important but 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 for us uh, today not not so uh, not going to get into that okay so um this is really the key challenge um and unfortunately there's, there's not really time to get into all the details but again what i'd like to do is sort of jump ahead and just give you a statement that i think will um help uh at least sort of indicate what this proof is doing and kind of the real sort of meat uh, behind this proof. So again, again, we, we jump. Okay, so uh, here's sort of a key statement, and I'm, I'm being a little bit vague about, about some things here, uh, or sort of, uh, uh, so take, be taken uh, with a grain of salt, uh, but, but it's essentially, essentially the truth here. Okay, so uh, now I'm going to let V be a fixed point on the sphere. Okay, so just no, no longer random. And I'm given some scale, again, uh, at, least epsilon, uh, at least exponentially small. And in addition, I'm given um, W1 up to WCN, so linearly many new vectors uh, that are orthogonal and on the unit sphere, right? So this is sort of like a partial orthogonal basis consisting of linearly many dudes um, on the unit sphere. And what we're interested in is the following quantity. So x is a random plus one minus one vector, just uniform at random. And I'm interested in the slightly crazy uh, and confusing quantity. So I'm interested in this random walk, our original v inner product x. And I'm interested in this one at this very, very, very tiny scale. So this exponentially small scale. And now I'm interested in a whole bunch of other events, events uh, uh, sorry, random walks. Um, or these, these linear sums, w1 inner product x all the way up to w constant n inner product x up to some uh, sort of macroscopic scale. So this beta here, we should think of as a large, sorry, a small but fixed constant. And what, this, what our result's going to say is that we can actually um, decouple this event here from this event. 
right? So we're going to say that basically these two events, this thing on the left and this thing on the right, are approximately negatively dependent, unless V has some special structure. So let me just write down the result is that we have this thing here is at most this. So this is sort of like negative dependence up to I'm going to allow this factor R um, to be here. And I'm going to allow a, a little exponent uh, uh, C here. <clears throat> and this is all true unless V has some specific structure. Um, and I don't really want to get into that, but it's let me just say that it's it's it is indeed pretty strong. Um, and uh, sort of once we have our hands on that structure, we can, yeah, we we sort of go a different route, but we it's you know we have quite a bit of strength all of a sudden. Okay, and let me just mention here that these events here are like exponentially small. So these are sort of you know this probability space. An atom is like two to the minus n, and these events, both of these events have um, probability um, can be as small as e to the minus c n. So this is really sort of delving deep into this uh, probability space. Okay, so that's actually all I want to say um, about this. I'm just trying to give you this as a, as a key lemma. Clearly, we're somehow dealing with dependence, actually using this. Um, obviously, I, I haven't explained at all how to use it, but, but I'm sure your, your intuitions will sort of uh, indicate that, that, that there has to be something going on behind this, this result. Okay, so now, um, all oh, right, sorry, and, and this is really the, the key to proving our, our exponential bound for random symmetric matrices. Um, so I should say at this point, you might be wondering, so why minus one, one uh, uh, uniform, right? So what's so special about this? Why not something more general? And indeed something more general is true. So I don't wanna say anything about that yet, but um, what, one should sort of think that this minus one, one case is always the hardest. Uh, I don't know if there's a counterexample that, to that statement, but it, it seems to always be the, the hardest problem. Uh, once, once you have that, the rest is uh, okay, maybe not immediate, but uh, seems to be nearby. Okay, so to, for, the, for the second half, uh, I would like to mention, uh, uh, mention a, a result um, that goes back to these, uh, these two characters here. So, on the left here, we have uh, J.E. Littlewood, one of the great uh, analysts of the 20th century, uh, and, and a bit, bit of a hero for me, uh, very interested in his problems. And of course, we have our old favorite friend over here, Paul Erdish. And uh, you can work out who this strapping young lad here is to his right. Um, so this problem goes back to these guys. And it concerns so-called Littlewood polynomials. And what is a Littlewood polynomial? It's just a polynomial where all the coefficients are plus minus one. And there's lots of lovely questions um, and, and, and sort of interest going back to this, to the 50s and, and so and, and many others um, about, so Littlewood, Poya, Sego, these sorts of people, um, about the behavior of such polynomials. But to, to today we're interested in, in the following question. So, how closely can a degree n Littlewood polynomial approximate the co constant function on the unit circle? Okay, so let, let's try to put a little bit of uh, meat on the bones here. So uh, I'm interested on the unit circle, or I should have said uh, on the unit circle. So I, I mean in the complex plane. So basically I wanna shove e to the i theta in here. So let me just do that and then rename this whole thing with, with theta just to, because We'll be working on the unit circle for, from now on. <clears throat> and what this question is asking is, well, how close can this function here be to a, uh, to a constant function? And it turns out if you do just a little, if you do Parseval and so on, you should, you, you'll be able to see that uh, if it's close to any constant function, it has to be square root n, just because that's what the average of the square value is. Okay. So how close can an exponential sum like this be to square root n? And uh, this led to the definition of a flat polynomial. Or, so here I have a degree n polynomial, and I'm interested in how closely um, I can uh, approximate this root n. So here I imagine 
C being a fixed constant and N being very, very large, right? And I'm saying, is it possible? Uh, sorry, yeah, so, and, and the question is, do there exist flat Littlewood polynomials of all degrees, right? So is it possible to approximate this root N with only a constant sort of factor distortion? Okay, so this, this problem, uh, goes back to Erdish, and let's just take a, take a look at a few, few examples here. So this, is, uh, I, this sort of slide was taken from, from a presentation of Elisco, who did a huge amount of computation on this problem, actually. So yeah, so I, I certainly did not make this photo. So OK, so what is this big jumble here? So this is the complex plane, right? Real part, imaginary part, like this. and. Um, What's happening is I'm, I'm moving theta from zero to two pi, and I'm watch, I'm just sort of plotting um, what happens. I get a sort of a, a trajectory um, uh, if I just plot all the different values of f theta, right? Okay, so then I jumble around, go flying around zero, and I get this trajectory. And the question is, how closely can I approximate the unit circle? So this is like a random like polynomial. It's actually made using the bond two digits of e so but essentially random we, we can assume um and you see that it doesn't do a very good job at approximating the unit circle <laughs> so i should say that this one is one times root n it's scaled by the root of the degree okay but actually you can do a whole lot better right so this is a, the best polynomial of degree 50 as calculated by obisco um, and you really see that we are starting to approximate the unit circle here um, this kind of cool behavior. And, and indeed, um, uh, Littlewood picked up this question of, of Erdős and seemed to think really hard about it and, and ultimately conjectured that these polynomials should exist. Uh, perhaps, you know, it sort of looked like that from that last picture that, that they might exist as well, right? Um, so he, he indeed conjectured that Littlewood polynomials exist, flat Littlewood polynomials. Um, and uh, in, in uh, at the end of his life, he sort of popularized this question quite a bit and ultimately put it in this uh, fairly famous book uh, or monograph, I suppose, of his uh, at the end of his life, sort of where he published a lot of the questions that he had thought about um, and sort of shared with students. Um, and it's actually kind of an interesting, interesting read, this, this book. And he, in, in this, he devotes quite a bit of time to the problem of fat, flat Littlewood polynomials. And, and he has this actually nice comment on the problem, which he says, uh, whoops, um, I've made many attempts to find a flat Littlewood polynomial. Of course, he doesn't call it flat Littlewood polynomial, but based on F. F is some thing that was sort of close that he was trying to modify, but all in vain. Um, and so this, indeed, this, this, this problem received quite a bit of attention, uh, as Bela mentioned through the, through the years. Um, Actually, going back to Rudin and Shapiro, some of you will know the Rudin Shapiro polynomials actually kind of came out of thinking about an aspect of this problem, all the way up to the major breakthrough of Cajon on a, a relaxed version of this problem. And uh, also, names like Bombieri and Bourgain published uh, sort of important uh, works on this. Oh, I should mention also in the combinatorics world, uh, Spencer and, and Beck, but we'll, we'll come to that in a minute. And uh, the second result I'd like to mention uh, for you guys today is uh, a result joint with uh, Paul Ballister, Bela Bolobosh, Rob Morris, this is myself, uh, and uh, Marius Tiba, where we showed actually uh, that flat Littlewood polynomials exist. So Littlewood would, was indeed correct in, in thinking that they exist, um, and we are able to, to construct such polynomials. So let me just put a little bit of meat on the bones here. So uh, just to spell out, spell out what this means is for all n, at least three, there is a Littlewood polynomial. So right, so this one of this polynomials is plus minus one coefficients for which we have always this bound for some absolute constant. And our constant is like two to the 200 or something like that. Okay. so. You might think at this point, okay, very well, very well, but uh, where, where's the combinatorics here? Well, this, this doesn't sound like combinatorics at all. This is, this, is, this is harmonic analysis. 
But let me try to hint just that this is really, in essence, almost entirely a combinatorial problem. Um, and, and, to, and to see this, let me consider a slightly weaker problem that actually was one of the problems considered um, in the 80s and before, um, uh, which is the following. So here I have a polynomial like this, an exponential polynomial. And what if I just want to control the upper, right? right? Oh. And say I just want to control the upper bound, right? So here I've given up on the lower bound, and I just want to prove an upper bound, where c is an absolute constant. So this actually was initially solved by uh, Rudin and Shapiro, and uh, but it is actually linked to a uh, to an interesting uh, to the to the famous pro uh, uh, work of Spencer. Uh, his six standards deviations suffice. So let me just remind you what this is and write it sort of in parallel here. So Spencer proved in '85 using this partial color coloring method of Joseph Beck the following theorem about set systems. So I have a ground set, set, one up to 2n. And now I take n sets. And for simplicity, let's just assume they're all half size sets. OK? Um, what Spencer's theorem says is, is I can find a coloring of this ground set with plus 1, minus 1. Right? So I'm going to call this somewhat strangely call it epsilon to parallel what's going on up here. So this is a function, so I'm, I'm just coloring all my elements with epsilon with plus minus one, so that the discrepancy on each edge is as small as possible. And, and uh, Spencer proved that you can always find with a constant root n. And uh, if you sort of squint at these two problems here, we see that they're really the same thing, right? So we have this constant root n, constant root n. Okay, so this is sort of like a continuous version of Spencer's theorem. And, uh, and uh, this, this observation is not at all new to me. So indeed, Spencer, in his original paper, this is one of his first motivations to give a, give a different proof. And it's really a completely different proof of this one-sided uh, bound here that goes back to Rudin and Shapiro's work on the Littlewood uh, polynomials. OK, um, how am I doing for time, actually? I kind of lost when I started. But, uh, but let me just say a, a couple a couple words so about about how to go further. So the problem here is with so so I mean this this connection has been known for a long time, but okay clearly there's some important combinatorial thinking behind all of this. <clears throat> but the problem with this these constructions coming from these Spencer examples is they actually are going to look more like this random example close to zero. So it's going to have lots of points that go really close to zero. OK, so now we've contained the outside. Great. Squish that down. But we're still going to have lots of points close to 0. And uh, the idea is, is to somehow um, basically start with some sort of Spencer type thing, uh, polynomial, and now try to control all the places that it spends close to 0. And then I want to modify it um, by sort of pushing out all those places that it's close to 0. OK, and let me just give one slide a bit of, a bit of flavor um, to put on your tongue for, for what's going on here. OK, so um, it turns out, so here there's some, uh, some, some missing steps, but you'll take my word for it, that after a few sort of reduction simplifications, I can write f theta in the following form. OK, so I've lost sort of half my, my, half, my, half my entropy here, but I can write it in this form where A is some set. OK, and for us, let's just say A is going to be the, A will be the, the set of even numbers. And so this guy is the set of all odd numbers less than n over 2, like that. But the really important thing here is that I've written this as a real part, this cosine polynomial, and an imaginary part. And I'm totally free to choose these epsilon k's, totally true, uh, free to choose them. And so the idea is, OK, let's try to throw down something here that's like this Spencer-like polynomial. And, and I'm going to try to control all the places where it's small. And now we have this cool independent direction, this imaginary direction. And this is really the, now this is really the, the heart of the, the issue 
is we want to somehow define a polynomial that pushes f up, right? That pushes our polynomial up. Um, 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 when uh, this part of the polynomial is small. So it pushes f up and away from zero when this part is small. So just a little uh, quick little sli sli slideshow on this. So here I have this crazy, this is my Spencer type polynomial. This is the, the cosine part that I've defined. Whoops. Um, this is, is the green curve. Okay, and okay, so here it only crosses four times. Really, it's crossing like a linear number of times. Uh, that would just kind of be ugly to draw. And here, this shaded, um, this dotted region here, this yellow region, this is the danger zone. So if, if my polynomial goes into this region, um, and in fact, these little bits here, that's where I need to push my polynomial up. So the idea is if I can control the number of these and to, you sort of need to, so these are my little bad intervals, my dangerous intervals. And if we can show that there's not too many of them and they're not too clumped together in any way and, and a few other annoying things, uh, but basically that, <clears throat> what we can do ultimately is now define a sine polynomial that's gonna sort of push, that's gonna be large on each one of these intervals. Okay, so, um, okay, so, so this is really the, the meat of this project here um, and but let me just, let me say again, two words about it. So how do we define this cool sine polynomial that's gonna be large um, on each one of these bad intervals? There's gonna be like constant, uh, like a linear number of these bad intervals. And they're all actually about uh, one over n in size. Um, and the idea is, is to, first of all, we need to decide which way we want to push these intervals. So is my sine polynomial going to be here, positive or negative on each of these? Okay, so first there's some choice of how we, um, which direction we push. <clears throat> and then what we'd like to do is for each epsilon k, I'm now going to define a new, I'm actually going to define a probability distribution on these epsilon k that sort of evaluates how well this term um, brings me to my goal of pushing all of these intervals up. So some sort of aggregate statistic that says, ah, how well does this sign help me in my goal? Um, and then based on that, I'm going to define epsilon k to be some random variable. And then once I have that, actually all of these different values, all of these theta values are nice um, sub-Gaussian ra random variables. And you can actually sort of go through and use dis discrepancy theory type ideas to now, um, to now actually show that there exists such a polynomial um, that works out for all of these and also doesn't ruin the upper bound at the same time. Okay, so that's all I wanna say um, about flat Littlewood polynomials exist. Um, but let me just leave you with uh, the following slide. Uh, so what do we, the, the, the two results I mentioned, uh, first of all, that uh, the singularity probability of a random symmetric matrix is exponentially small. And the second result is that uh, indeed flat Littlewood polynomials uh, exist. So I'll, I'll stop you, stop there, and, and, and thank you very much. So, so, so in alphabetical uh, order, now it's uh, the next uh, awardee was Lisa Sauerman, but as uh, Professor Nesetriel said, uh, she has a plenary talk on, uh, on the 9th in the afternoon. So uh, I don't know if you want, uh, Yarek, to add something at this point or or the Laudatio will be also given in the, on the 9th? Laudatio will be given on the 9th by, by Professor Jacob Fox. As the awardee, so which will be presented by Janusz Pach. Yes, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's my honor to introduce the next recipient of the European Prize in Combinatorics, uh, Istvan Toman. Uh, Istvan is, uh, well, together with uh, uh, Peter Pach, one of the most prominent young representatives of the Hungarian School of Combinatorics. Uh, also, it's uh, nice that he was uh, he's, uh, going to speak after Julian because he was also Vela Bolabash's uh, uh, student in Cambridge. 
and uh, he started out as an extraordinary talent. He uh, won gold medals at the International Mathematical Olympiad, and he was uh, one year he was the sole winner of the Schweizer competition, which is uh, arguably the strongest mathematical uh, competition on earth. And um, I think that this is a, a very good year for him. Uh, he had hit this, uh, his wedding this year and uh, was earlier this year, he won the Greenwald Medal of the Boyai Mathematical Society. Uh, so what, what can I say about uh, Istvan? He concentrates on well-known difficult problems, combinatorial problems that have been investigated by uh, many leading combinatories, and he's never satisfied with uh, small partial results. I, I only want to mention uh, perhaps uh, two examples, uh, one from, from this year, from the last year, uh, the solution of a 60 years old uh, problem of Brown, Erdős and Chosh. So the question was that um, how many triangles, how many uh, edges in a three uni uniform hypergraph guarantee the existence of a torus or any other uh, given uh, surface. And uh, together with uh, Kupavsky, Poyansky, and Zakharov, uh, uh, Istvan proved that uh, the answer is n to the five half, which was uh, conjectured for, for, for many, many years by uh, Natilinia. The other example I want to mention is uh, is a solution uh, of the uh, erdos hainal conjecture for string graphs, for graphs that are intersection graphs of, uh, uh, of strings, of, of arcs, uh, continuous arcs uh, in the plane. This erdos hainal conjecture uh, is uh, one of the most important uh, kind of uh, open problems in in in, in MC theory, and uh, in for for this important special case, Istvan uh, provided a solution, and I could continue his outstanding results uh, for a long time. For instance, uh, he is perhaps the number one expert. Uh, uh, in the world on, on extremal problems of partially ordered sets, so on. But I don't want to steal any more minutes from his lecture, and I am very happy to uh, congratulate him again. And uh, Istvan, please uh, present your talk. Yeah, so thank you very much, Janusz, for the introduction. So I hope everyone can hear me. Um, I take this as a yes. 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 Okay. So I'm very honored to receive this prize. And uh, I would like to thank the committee for the decision. And I would also like to congratulate the other recipients, Patty, Julian, and Lisa. Um, so let me share my screen. And let's, let me just jump right into the talk. I want to introduce to you a field that I find especially fascinating. And this is about the Ramsey theory of structural graphs or these erdős kind of results that Janusz already mentioned. But first of all, let's start with what is actually Ramsey theory. So if I had to summarize Ramsey theory in one sentence, then I would quote Motskin, who says that complete disorder is impossible. So that this kind of observation or phenomenon is observed in is present in mathematics in many different contexts. For example, in Van der Werden's theorem about long arithmetic progressions or the Hasjee theorem about combinatorial lines. But maybe it's most present in Ramsey's theorem. So what is Ramsey's theorem about? 
So I will talk about clicks and independence sets in graphs. So in order to not say every time a click or an independence set, I will just call them homogeneous sets. And I will denote by home G the size of the largest homogeneous set. So you can think of a homogeneous set of a graph as a, as a completely ordered subgraph. So now the famous theorem of Ramsey, which he formulated in the language of logic, says the following. For every positive integer n, there is its smallest number rn, such that every graph with n vertices, contain, RN vertices contains a homogeneous set of size n. A bit later, Adish and Sekadesh proved the quantitative version of this result. So they showed that rn indeed exists, and it is at most exponential in n. And later, they showed that Rn is indeed exponential, so it is lower bounded by 2 to the n over 2. So we know that Rn is exponential, but as you can see, there is still a huge gap between the lower and upper bound. And it is an it is a important open problem to, to reduce each of, these, each of these bounds. But after 70 years, all the improvements that we made are in some lower lower terms, lower order terms. So, but let's look at this lower bound a little bit. So, so where does this two to the n over two come from? So kind of the genius idea of Erdős was to just look at a random graph. So decide whether each edge is present just by a coin flip. And then this, then he showed using probabilistic techniques that such graph contained only logarithmic size homogeneous sets with very high probability. So this established that Aran is indeed exponential, but some people might not be satisfied with this answer because we would like to see some deterministic constructions of graphs having similarly good Ramsey properties. So then the problem arises, are there deterministic constructions of graphs with only logarithmic size homogeneous sets? So this problem again turned out to be very difficult and just to give you a brief history of this and to show how slow the progress has been on. So it is actually trivial to show a graph which has homogeneous sets of size square root and you can take the, the disjoint union of square root and clicks of size square root. But already to go below that square root and you need some genuine ideas and not did just that, so he showed the construction with homogeneous sets of size and to the one over three. But then the real breakthrough came by Frank and Wilson, who using results from extremal set theory, constructed graphs with homogeneous sets of size, only e to the constant square root log n over log log n. And uh, the current state of the art is due to Chad Topatri Zuckerman and independently Cohen, who should deterministic constructions of graphs with homogeneous sets of size only e to the log log n to some constant. So kind of the difficulty of this problem suggests that maybe graphs that have only very small clicks and independent sets must be inherently random like in certain sense. So turning this in the other way around, we could say that if someone presents a certain graph with some structure, then we expect it to contain much larger homogeneous sets. And indeed, th th there are many theorems in combinatorics which kind of support this, this observation. And maybe one of the most famous such theorems is the theorem of Erdős and Hoynow. So they prove that if we have a, if we fix some small graph H and we consider a graph G on n vertices, which avoids this small graph H as an Hindu subgraph, then this graph G contains a homogeneous set of size, at least e to the constant square root log n, where this constant only depends on the forbidden subgraph H. So again, in other words, the moment we put some local constraint in our graph, namely we, we forbid some small in the subgraph, then we immediately find, so this immediately forces the graph to contain much larger independences than the random graph. But actually, Erdős and Hoynow went even further. So they conjecture that such graphs should contain even larger homogeneous sets. So now the notorious Erdős Hoynow conjecture says that if we have a graph G, which avoids some small graph H as an Hindu subgraph, 
then G must contain a homogeneous set of polynomial size. So now this conjecture is still wide open and is being extensively studied. For example, it's been established for every graph H with at most four vertices. Also, Alon, Park, and Scheimer showed that if we have two graphs H1 and H2 that satisfy this conjecture, then with using a certain graph operation, we can create new graphs that also satisfy this conjecture. However, this operation is uh, it's pretty limited, so the so the family of graphs we get this way is still pretty scarce. So if we look at the five vertex graphs, then we essentially have this these three graphs which are not covered by this operation and four vertex graph. And when I say essentially, I mean complement up to complementation, because of course here it doesn't matter if if we take H or its complement. So up to complementation, we had the three following three open cases in the case of five vertex graph. So now the case of the bull and its complement was verified by Chudnovsky and Safra in 2008. And then this, this case of the C5 became kind of the most notorious open case of this conjecture because many believe that once you are able to resolve the conjecture for the case of C5, C5, you should be able to solve everything. Uh, this turned out to be not quite true. So very recently, the case of the C5 was established by Chudovsky, Scott, Simran, and Spirkel. And uh, unfortunately, their method only really gives C5, but it's still, this was a huge step forward. And now the, the smallest open case, the case of the P5 is still open. And now who knows, maybe this is the case that when which if you are able to solve, then you suddenly solve the whole conjecture. But uh, so later in this, the talk, I will get back to this case of the C5. So now this kind of shows you that the progress on the Erdosharna conjecture has been very slow. But this is a bit of a lie. Actually, there was a lot of progress on the Erdosharna conjecture in the past two decades. But maybe let me show you an equivalent formulation of this conjecture, which, which kind of lets you branch out in other interesting directions. So here is the equivalent formulation of this conjecture. So, so suppose that we have some hereditary family of graphs. So what does it mean? It means just a family of graphs, which is closed undertaking into subgraph. And suppose that this hereditary family is not, uh, um, not trivial, meaning this is not the family of all graphs. Then in this case, uh, every member of this family on n vertices contains a homogeneous set of polynomial size where this exponent of the polynomial only depends on this hereditary family F. So now indeed this, this equivalent formulation seen a lot of progress. And the nice thing about this is that we can you know, consider families of graphs which are not necessarily defined by a single forbidden subgraph, but maybe, maybe arise from geometric considerations. So let me show you one such very nice geometric result. So in 1994, Larman, Matushek, Park, and Turecci proved that if we have an intersection graph of n axis parallel boxes in the d-dimensional real space, then such a graph contains a homogeneous set of size roughly square root n. So here, this little o1 depends on this dimension d. So what does this theorem actually mean? So what do I mean by intersection graphs? So consider this family of boxes. Then I can define a graph which describes their intersection pattern. So I can assign a vertex to each of these boxes, and then I connect two vertices by an edge if the corresponding boxes have non empty intersections. Otherwise, I don't put an edge. Then what this theorem says essentially is that if I have n boxes in RD, then I can find either square root n of them, which are pairwise intersecting like these four boxes, or I can find roughly square root n of them, which are pairwise disjoint like these four boxes in this case. Hope it's visible. It's another very interesting result from the same paper 
is about convex sets. So Lerma, Matashev, Park, and Turachig also proved that if we have an intersection graph of convex sets in the plane, then such intersection graphs contain a homogeneous set of size n to the one over phi. So again, this means that if we have n convex sets in the plane, we can find either n to the one over five of them, which are pairwise intersecting, or n to the one over five of them, which are pairwise disjoint. And now you might wonder that why is this result only in the plane? Why this is in any dimension? So it turns out that this result already has no analog in higher dimensions because any graph can be realized as the intersection graph of convex sets in the in the three-dimensional space. And this is a very odd result of fit. But it turns out that this this kind of geometric type are the Schoenal result hold in a very general setting. And in order to talk about this geometric setting, let me talk about semi-algebraic graphs. So now I will give you a definition, which will be a bit convoluted at first, but I, I will try to explain to you. So we say that the graph is semi-algebraic of complexity T, its vertices are elements of the D-dimensional real space where D is bounded by T and the edges are defined by the sign patterns of atmos T polynomials of degree atmos T. So let's digest this definition. So basically what we have is that our, the vertices are a graph corresponds to some points in some fixed dimensional space in this picture in, in the plane. But also our vertices correspond to certain varieties. So these varieties are defined by these polynomials. So these varieties cut the plane into cells. And if I want to decide whether two vertices are connected by an edge, I look at the point, I look at the point corresponding to one right here, and I look at the, the variety corresponding to other. And now, and now the, the right cell is the is the cell below these varieties. Right? So for example, this point is, is connected to the vertex corresponding to this variety while this, the vertex corresponding to this point is connected to all the vertices which correspond to the varieties that are highlighted. So this point is connected to all other vertices while this point is only connected to the three highlighted uh, areas. And then it was proved by Alan Park, Nikasi, Radicic and Shoyer in 2005 that if we have a semi-algebraic graph of bounded complexity, then the family of such graphs satisfies the Erdős-Hajnal conjecture. So they contain homogeneous sets of size and to the constant where this constant only depends on the complexity. And the reason why this term is really useful because it applies to a really wide range of geometrically defined graphs. So for example, in the previous slide, we, we saw this intersection graph of boxes. It generalizes that result. It also generalizes some intersection graph of segments or any algebraic curves. It also, uh, this also covers families of incidence graph. And so it, it really applies to a wide range of such graphs. However, it, it also has some sh shortcomings. So for example, this result does not imply the result about convex sets because you cannot describe convex sets by semi-algebraic relation. And there is also a sibling con concept of semi-algebraic graphs, which we call algebraic graphs. So now the definition is very similar. Uh, the difference is that instead of looking over a real space, we actually look at any vector space over any field F. And now instead of defining the edges by sign patterns, we actually define them by just zero patterns. So of course, if we have some general uh, general field, then we might not have any meaningful ordering. So it doesn't make sense to define sign patterns, but we can still define them by zero patterns. And these algebraic graphs are also pretty important because they, for example, they appear very often in, in, in connection to construction, to Turan type or extreme problems. So this is a field that is pioneered by Boris Book, but they also appear in connection to Ramsey type constructions. And so with Bani Sudakov, we proved an analog 
of the this result from semi-algebraic graphs to algebraic graphs. So we managed to prove that if we have an algebraic graph of bounded complexity, then they satisfy the additional conjecture. So they contain polynomial size homogeneous sets. So you might think that these two terms are, are quite similar, but and you're right, but actually these two families of graphs can have very different properties and actually proving these required very different methods than the case of semi-algebraic graphs. Also, we managed to find like the right, right uh, dependence of this, this uh, exponent CT on T. So we know that in the worst case, it's a polynomial in one over T. And finally, somewhat surprisingly, these results generalize to are uniform hypergraphs as well. So, so far I've not talked about hypergraphs, but uh, just in case you know about them. So, so in the case of hypergraphs, so these, these Ramsey proper Ramsey type theorems are very different. And usually, usually they, uh, you can only find much, much smaller homogeneous sets than for usual graphs. But in the case of R uniform algebraic hypergraphs, you, always find polynomial size independent sets. And this is, for example, no longer true for semi-algebraic hypergraphs. Okay, but so the final thing I want to talk about is kind of what happens this beyond this algebra. So what happens with those kind of geometric graphs which we cannot capture using these algebraic techniques, which are, and one such example is string graphs. So first, so what's, so first of all, what is a string? String or what's known as a curve is just the image of some continuous function uh, from the interval zero one to the plane. So really the only condition we require is that this function is continuous. And then a string graph is just the intersection graph of curves in the plane. Um, so these string graphs are, our, so string graphs were introduced by Tanzer to study so-called topological circuits, but now they are widely studied in combinatorial geometry because they generalize a lot of different notions of intersection graphs. So, because uh, it turns out that anytime you have some are quite connected sets on the plane, their intersection graph is also a string graph. So if you have like convex sets in the plane, their intersection graph is also a string graph. So this generalizes all these concepts in the plane. And this, the related additional type of conjecture for string graphs was conjectured by Alan Park and Gassir Adichis and Shalir in their paper where they proposed these semi-algebraic graphs. So now, so they proposed the question that, is it true that string graphs contain uh, polynomial sized homogeneous sets? So now let me just give you some idea how string graphs can look like. So let's consider a metro map of the for, of, of a city. Um, so then you can view these metro lines as strings. And then the question you're interested in is, can you, uh, can you find a lot of metro lines that are either pairwise disjoint, like these three metro lines? Or can you find many metro lines that are pairwise intersecting like the rest of the metro lines. So of course, metro lines are maybe not the best example because you usually want them to be highly intersecting, but uh, hopefully you get the right idea. And also just out of curiosity, uh, I wonder if anyone can recognize uh, that which city's metro line is. So if you have any ideas, you can leave it in the chat or just think about it. I will tell you in the end. Um, so let, let's talk about the, what's, the, what's the progress on this conjecture. So already it follows from this, uh, an old, old paper of Larma, Matisha, Falk, and Trochik that this conjecture is true for so-called X monotone curves. So curve is X monotone if this function F is monotone in the X coordinate. So then it was proved by um, so then it was proved by, proved by folks, Park and Toad, that if we assume that any curves intersect at most a constant number of times, so at most k times, then this conjecture also holds. But now this constant c depends on this integer k. 
So finally, it was proved by Fox and Park that uh, that a slightly weaker bound for it. So they proved that such such string graphs are, so the string graphs are always contain homogeneous sets of size and to the constant over log log n. And finally, very recently, I managed to show that indeed the conjecture is true. So string graphs satisfy the erdos harnack conjecture. So it's uh, it's already pretty late, so I'm not going to tire you with some proof. I just want to want to tell you some some curious curious things about it. So actually, it turns out that one of the key lemmas that was needed in order to prove this theorem is 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 some lemma that's purely graph theoretical. It has not nothing to do with curves. It's just a lemma about bipartite graphs, and this. Lemma turned out to be quite powerful, so it had some some further applications. And now this is the point where I go back to this this notorious question about five holes in the Erdős Harnack conjecture. So graphs without cycles of length five. So because it turns out that that kind of this this same lemma was was the push that was needed to prove this conjecture. So and just to illustrate how, like, really how, how difficult this, this stuff case was. So very recently, two years ago, there was a result of Chudnovsky, Fox, Scott, and Seymour and Spirko who proved that if we have a graph on vertices, which contains no endoscopy of the five cycle, then such graph contain, contain homogeneous sets of size e to the constant square root log n log log n. So this is a square root log log n improvement over the over the bound of Erdős and Hoyna, which holds for every graph H. So then suddenly there was this huge jump by Trudnovsky, Scott, Simmer, and Spirko. And as I mentioned, uh, it turns out that this kind of this this lemma was was one of the key components as well. Of course, they I don't want to take away the results, or they also did a lot of other nice ideas. But I find it quite interesting that the, this kind of lemma appears in these two two pretty different problems. And uh, I think that's all I wanted to talk about. Uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, let me check the chat. So anyone who guessed Saul, then he was right. He or she was right. Thank you. So. We've gotten to the end of this award ceremony, and we will close it with some words by Professor Uriol Serra, who was the chair of the program committee of this edition of Eurocom. So. Thank you, Anna. So, okay, so th thank you all for coming. First of all, just uh, uh, say again once more congratulations to all the awardees of this prize. Uh, we wish them. Uh, successful careers, and uh, I think that they enrich very nicely the long list of uh, very uh, brilliant researchers which have been awarded this, pr this prize so far. So again, uh, our warmest congratulations. It is uh, very nice that uh, the conference hosts this prize, and uh, we are very, uh, very uh, proud of uh, uh, hosting it. And uh, we have to just acknowledge the support of the institutions that uh, make it possible uh, one edition after the other one. And uh, yeah, so again, it's a pity that uh, you cannot be all be here with us because we couldn't, we will be enjoying it uh, from our side and uh, we will be very happy that uh, you can share with us our, our, our happiness. And uh, that's it. Uh, so thank you all for coming. Tomorrow we will resume our conference. Uh, in the morning we have the invited lecture of David Wood, and then the parallel sessions. And I remind you that in the afternoon we will have this special session devoted to Robin Thomas with the plenary lecture of Sergei Norin and uh, invited lectures afterwards. So tomorrow afternoon there are no parallel sessions, there will be only this, only session. Huh? Sorry. <laughs> Don't say to Can you use? 
Oh, sorry. I, I was re reminded that the, the, there are indeed uh, parallel sessions after the special session devoted to Robin Thomas, so sorry about this. So that's it. <clears throat> so we will uh, join you again tomorrow morning.